we just sang the song, Father, I Adore You. And in that song, the last verse says, Spirit, I Adore You. And the reason we sang that is because I think that it's important for us to wrap our mind around the Holy Spirit's work in our lives. And so we have been talking last week about the promise of the Father, and we, began, we were looking at it in, that, in the context of it being present and being shared with the believers on the day of Pentecost, which was a prophecy that God the Father had given through his Son in his word and then culminated in the new covenant or in the extending covenant, whichever way you want to put it. And so we looked at the first four verses of Acts chapter 2. And so I want us to look at verse number 4 and following. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not these which speak Galileans? And how, how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? The Parthenians and the Medes and the Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Perga, Pamphylia and Egypt and all the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. These are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is about the third hour of the day. But this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel. And it came to pass in the last days, he said, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Prophesy, I'll get it said right in a minute. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, and blood fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood there before the great and terrible notable day of the Lord is come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we might begin to once again see the impact of the Holy Spirit in our lives and the marvelous work that he has continued and Lord continues to do until such time as you call us home, until such time as the end of the age occurs, until such time as that final day comes when all men will know and acknowledge without question that you are King of kings and Lord of lords, until the culmination of this earthly timeline that we live in and work through and understand in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, this word tongues, and this is going to be controversial, okay? And I will tell you that. But I will say this up front, that when you teach the Word of God, 
And man has another idea about what God is saying. It will always be controversial. But God is always exact. He always says exactly what he means and means exactly what he says. So if God takes the time to detail an event, you can understand that that event is singularly important for a specific design and purpose that God has ordained. In this case, talking about Joel, it was ordained in the first covenant. So the first covenant is involved, and at the end of Joel's prophecy here, he talks about the day of the notable day of the Lord. Well, when is that? That's when Jesus returns. That's his second coming. That's when Jesus sets all things right. So this prophecy then is all encompassing. It's starting from the first covenant and going all the way through to the end of the second covenant. It's all that God is going to do in between and how it looks and what it looks like in our world and our life today. So the first thing is that sometimes we want to put our own mind and heart into the scriptures and our own understanding rather than letting the scripture interpret scripture. I had a great friend of mine whose name was Dr. Archie Middleton. And Dr. Middleton used to say, and I pasted it in my hat as the old cowboy said, I pasted this saying in my hat. If the scripture read makes sense, look for no other sense, lest you fall into nonsense. I have found that to be so true throughout my study of God's word and reading all of these folks out there who are trying to, to make sense out of the word of God. And some of them haven't listened well. They are a little slack in comprehension on reading. So if you look at this, it says here that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So the Lord was doing a miracle work here to show that the promise of the Father had arrived. That it was active. That it would continue. And so the first evidence and the first thing that he did to do that, according to the prophet Joe, was that there was going to be something uttered, there was going to be something done that was going to what? Glorify God and glorify God's word. So if you look here in this scripture, it talks about, in verse 11, it says, the wonderful works of God. So what is it that these people are doing? They are people who are not of the heritage of this long litany of people of, that we listed here. God listed all the people that were there. Told us who they were. Peter didn't get up. And the eleven didn't get up and start speaking in these other languages. They spoke the language they knew, right? And the miracle was, as they spoke the language they knew, people who were out there from all over the world heard the gospel in their own tongue, in their own dialect, precisely so. Why? That the word of God might be given out. That the works of God might be known. I've always had some really good friends who were missionaries. And these missionaries had real talent. Because they could go into foreign countries. And I believe it's a gift to God. And they could understand the gibberish of these other people. The, impl the implications of it all and all that went on. If I went down to... South America and tried to speak Spanish, it would not be pretty. No one would know what I was saying, and if I said something, I would say it wrong. I remember one time, and if you'll pardon me, the, the, uh, this illustration, but it's true. I had a missionary who was from South America come up, who, whose dominant language is, is uh, Spanish in some form of variation. And he was new on the field, and he was trying to go and buy in the open market, which they had down there, a loaf of bread. So he goes up to this 
open counter where the bread is being made, and he uses the language of the people he thinks. And the guy looked at him with a confused look, so he repeated it again. And there was another person there who was a translator who came up to him and said, do you know what you just asked that guy for? He said, no, I, I'm trying to get him to give me a, a loaf of bread. He said, well, you asked him for a basket of prostitutes. <laughs> it is a gift of God that allows us to speak the language, to have the language. It's a gift of God that does that. It's the Holy Spirit of God, and it's doing it for the very reason to share the wonderful, marvelous works of an almighty God who is glorious in his, in his presence. He's glorious in his work. He's a glory to the whole. He's all of those things. We sang in our opening service this morning, How Great Thou Art. And we talked about all those mighty majesties and those things that God does in his life and in our lives and how he shares that with us. But he shares his life with us. He shares his promise with us. He shares his glory with us. But he does it in this word. That's how he does it. It's the word of God. Isn't it? It's the word of God that teaches us how to live for God. It's the word of God that teaches us how to walk with the Holy Spirit. It's the word of God that tells us what the Holy Spirit is and what he does. Listen, if we didn't have this word, we wouldn't know anything about it. We might have a feeling, we might have an emotion, we might have all those things, but we would never be able to put any sense to it at all. The miracle that God performed here was that, that all these people from all over the globe, all of these different nationalities, people with hundreds of different dialects, as the word was being displayed and given, they heard every word in their own language. That's what the book says. That's what the book says. Notice there are no unknown tongues there. Every tongue there is known. You see, I think, I personally think, and Paul put it down too, I don't think it's scriptural to have unknown tongues. I don't think that's scriptural at all. Paul said, okay, if you want to insist on having un unknown tongues, then if you're going to have unknown tongues, then you have to have a interpreter in present, and that interpreter has to be see, able to say with total accuracy what you just said, and it has to be based on the Scripture and the Word of God and the declaration of God's gospel. If it doesn't do that, then you don't do it. Now, you can find that if you want to in the book of 1 Corinthians, the 2 Corinthians. Paul makes a lot of talk about it. Because it had been used in a wrong way. Listen, speaking in tongues, in tongues is not an evidence of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is not. I know a lot of Pentecostal preachers that are good friends of mine. Love them. And I asked them this question at some point when we get real close and friendly and they know I'm not attacking them. I said, have you ever spoken in tongues? And about 85% or more of them will say no. Why? This is the evidence that this doctrine holds. And I'm not going to say the assembly has got, but a lot of people hold, well, you've got to do these supernatural works to show that the work of God is in you, that you have the grace of God and that you have the Spirit of God, and that you've been endowed with the Holy Spirit of God, and which God declared would be present in every man at the day of Pentecost, and it was, but it was not based upon anything they did. It was based upon everything God did. You know what the best evidence of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God in your life is? It's not speaking in tongues. It's reading this book and living by it. That's it right there. That's the hard line that God puts out. You notice, if you we read this whole passage, that God said two or three times it was all about the work of God, the word of God, the delivery of the word of God, and the program of God, not man's program. It was so astounding to these people that when they witnessed this event, 
They thought every one of them was drunk. Now, why would they think that? They would think they were babbling. Isn't that what people do when they're drunk? They don't make any sense. To them, they make perfect sense, but to everybody else, they say, yeah, right, but you're drunk. <laughs> drunk people do different things. They don't act in the right way. We don't understand what they're saying. They murder. They, they slur their words. They, they get the words out of order. They do all kinds of things. And so these people witnessing this uh, event programmed by the Holy Spirit for the delivery of the Word of God to the globe was misinterpreted by those who were witnessing it and saying that these guys are drunk. These Galileans have been up tipping the bottle early in the morning. Like the old Irishman said, ah, let them just have a little shot for me in the morning to catch my guys going. Right? No! That was not the case. It was not the time of the day when they would have been doing that sort of thing. So what's going on? It's the miracle of God being displayed in open and being misunderstood. That going on today? Are there a lot of people who are having trouble with the promise of the Father? Are there a lot of people who are misinterpreting that? Are there a lot of people who have trouble with what God has clearly said and stated, and they have trouble with the miracle of God, the works of God, the program of God, the, the goodness of God? Listen, we don't understand a lot of the things that God does and why He doesn't, but it doesn't matter. What matters is, is that it's born of God. Right? And everything God does and everything God purposes in his word and in your life and in mine is for the foretelling of the gospel. That's what it means to prophesy that I was saying badly a while ago. It means to prophesy. What does that mean? That means to bring forth. That means to tell. Right? Tell the word of God. Tell what God has done for you in your life. Tell people that Jesus is real, God is real, heaven is real. The world's always looking around trying to find verification for all of these things. Well, listen, the verification for these things is not found in the world. It is found in the religious community by those who have in them the Holy Spirit of God, who is directing them, leading them, guiding them, and taking them on life's journey. The Spirit of God in you is the power of God in you, and the power of God in you is to deliver the word of God that you get in you through the spirit of God that you take to somebody else. That's what it's about. Nobody cares what I think, or at least I think that. Sometimes I'll tell Donna something and she says, okay, sure. Well, you don't really care about that anyway, do you? <laughs> and vice versa, right? We have to tell what it is that God is doing that is functionary to the will of God, to the deliverance of God's message to those who are without the faith. These people that thought these guys were drunk, they were not Christians. They were not believers. That's why they didn't understand it. There's no remarking here from those who are believers, who had the Holy Spirit, who knew who God was and what was God doing. None of them questioned it. It was the lost people who misunderstood what God was doing. We find that still true today. We find those who are struggling with the prophecy that was given by Job. No, they were not drunk. But this was the fulfillment of what God said was going to happen. When is that to happen? Did you see that in verse number 17? When was it to happen? The last days. Guess what? We are living in the last days. Hello? Last days. God said, listen, Joel, I want you to write this down, and in the last days, I'm going to make it alive, and everybody's going to see it, and it's the promise of the Father. We are living in the last days. 
You say, well, how so, Pastor Bob? Well, I'll tell you how so. Because the Bible tells us in the New Testament that at any moment, at any time, Jesus could stand on the portals of glory and your father could say to, the, to Jesus, go get my children and Jesus will stand upon a cloud and he will give out the call, come up hither. In a moment, in an instant, in a twinkling of an eye, we're gone. We're like so much history. We shall all be changed, he said, right? In the moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Is that the end of the promise of the Father? Oh, no. No, that's just an event like Pentecost was in a series of events that God's bringing to culminate and to complete the timeline of history that you and I understand and live in as best as we can. See, this prophecy was given in the last days that you and I live in. And so God has given out His Holy Spirit and undiluted power to the Word of God to reach out to a lost and dying word, world to bring them to the salvation of Jesus past before the shout is given. Because once the shout is given, it's over. All the chances are gone. Right? The Bible says if you have heard the Word of God and the Word of God has been preached to you and the Spirit of God has talked to you about the Word of God and you've walked away from it, the day that Jesus calls his children out, you are done. Your destiny is sealed. There will be no more offers of repentance for you. You believe that? Better it's true. But wait a minute. He says here at the end of this that the Lord will call the name of the Lord shall be saved. In verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who is that? <laughs> what did Jesus tell us? I'm going to tell you this. What did Jesus say? Heaven and earth shall pass away. Right? But my word what? Shall never pass away. Did you know that after the rapture of the church, after the rapture of God's people, and we are called out, did you know that the word of God will still be here? Did you know that? Did you know that the Antichrist and the false prophet and all of them are going to be using the word of God in a wrong way, but they're going to be using it? Do people do that today? All the time. <laughs> not new. That's not a new thing. But there's coming a time. Do you remember in the old covenant where God had came and he had told the children of God, you go over into the promised land. You go over there. And what did they do? They rebelled, right? And God had them wandering around in the desert for how long? Forty years. Why? He said, I am going to have them wandering around in the desert for 40 years. No one in this generation that rebelled against my word and disobeyed me will go into the promised land. When they're all dead, then we'll go in. So when all of those who heard the word did not receive the word. When that generation passes, God will activate his word all over again. You say, oh, well, wait a minute now. How's that going to happen? He's got some prophets hanging out there. Read in the book of the Revelation. They're going to show up, and the world is going to hate them and try to kill them, but they can't. Not good grammar, but that's true. Why? Because they've got the seal of God upon them. That's why. And they're going to deliver the word of God. And there is going to be a revival and people are going to get saved. Is there going to be people saved during that time? You better believe in multitudes. So when you read this passage here in the book of Acts, 
You need to understand it. Starts talking about the sun being turned into darkness and the moon and blood. That's Revelation, guys. Right? That's the book of the Revelation. And it talks about all those things that are going to happen. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, he says in verse 22. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel of the foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So Peter starts the message, doesn't he? And what is the message? Isn't it the gospel? Is it not the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Isn't that what it's all about? For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my faith, and for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Wherefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad? Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. So what is he talking about here? He's talking about the hope of the gospel, isn't he? He's talking about living for Jesus. He's talking about the life that you have in Christ. He talks about the resurrection of Jesus. He goes on to talk about that. But what is all of that about? That is the message. Right? Peter delivers a message of God. And look what happens in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter, and unto the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, because of the remission of sins. I know your Bible says for the remission, but for and because of the same thing. Remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What he's talking about here, and I won't go into the theology of that book, that particular phrase right now, that's another time. But I will tell you this, they were saved. And when they heard the word of God and said, what do we do? Peter said, you get saved. You repent. You submit yourself to the authority of God. You claim that sacrifice that Jesus made for you upon the cross. You receive that sacrifice. And when you receive that sacrifice, you're going to go out and you're going to follow Jesus. And the first thing you're going to do when you follow Jesus is get baptized. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's why. That's what that means. When you get saved, you get the Holy Spirit. When you get the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, if you read in the book of John, tells you how to live righteous, and the first thing, and the first requirement of righteousness is when you get saved, you get baptized. I don't understand people who wait 20, 30, 40 years to get baptized. Listen, when I got saved, Jesus touched me right away. The first thing, nobody had to talk me into it. The first thing I did after I submitted and committed my life to Jesus Christ was say, where do I get baptized and when? And it wasn't many days hence. You see, when you are honest with God and you're sincere with God and you follow God's directive, you do what God says. Right? What you do. And the first thing God says is once you've received me as Lord and Savior of your life, once you've repented of your sin and I've come into your life and given you the Holy Spirit, the first thing you're going to do is get baptized. That's what all that means. So where are you at? If you read the entire passage here, which we don't have time to do today, you will see that the message of the gospel was declared. And by the way, all of these words we just read, guess who was hearing them? The rest of the world. Peter was speaking this message, and all of these people were hearing what Peter said in their own language. 
There's a whole written dialogue here, a whole sermon given here by Peter that the world hears on that day. Wow. And the miracle and the promise of the Father is this. 2,000 years later, we're still doing it. <laughs> All right? Why? Because of the Holy Spirit. The work of God has not ceased. It's ongoing. The gospel has not gone away. It's still present. The conviction of God is still here. The work of God is still going on. The purpose of God is still going on. The design of God is still going on. The timeline of God is still going on. It will not end till he ends it. Get on board. Strap yourself on to the book, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and live that way. And you don't have to worry how the journey will end. It won't matter. <laughs> It'll be a good journey. Because anything Jesus is in, it's good. We sing this little song. I don't think we've ever sang it here. Donna might know, but it's called Little As Much As God Is In It. Has anybody else ever heard that song? Little as much as God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. Wow. Isn't that something? It all started here in the book of Acts with the coming of the Holy Spirit. God said, if you'll commit yourself to me, you may be small in stature, but you'll be great in the eyes of God. None of these Galileans were educated men. They were fishermen, crude men. But God used them to revolutionize the world that we live in. Wow. Wow. Don't ever give up on the Holy Spirit of God. Don't let anybody cheapen that which you've gotten from God. It's a great gift that God has given you. And it's the promise of the Father living in you for the rest of your life. And, and to your children's life and your children's children's life until the end comes when Jesus himself will declare it over. Until then, it is not over. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of it. God, we pray that you will use it for all, your honor and your glory. Lord, there's so much here that I was not able to say, more or less an overview but, oh, Lord, we need to recognize that you have not cheapened the gospel, that it is power, it is effectual, and it's still changing lives today for any who will submit themselves to it. And so God help us to be as those men of old and to say openly and boldly, Lord, what shall we do? And then do what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.